and Steve. Okay, well, uh, there's going to be people coming in continually, I believe. We expect uh, upwards of 50, and we've got a little less than half of that for now, but uh, I believe we'll get started. So, uh, a reminder this is being streamed live on the web via the ALSO website. So, uh, if it doesn't look like we're looking at all the attendees in the eye continually, we'll occasionally be looking at the camera as well. And really appreciate you coming uh, to this first of hopefully more falls receptions and meet and greets. Uh, my name is Greg Murfeld, and I'm actually a falls patient. Uh, this is Steve Gibson, who was kind enough to come out from uh, ALSA National in Washington. And uh, we'll be kind of facilitating this. So. Uh, we have a few slides, or we have quite a few slides that we'd like to cover. Uh, we want to keep it conversational and, and a discussion basis. Um, we're also allowing a few people to come in via chat to ask some questions. So I think we'll, to kind of set the tone, go to the next slide, Steve. Um, I approached the MDA and ALSA myself as a patient about six months ago with a concept of, uh, trying to do something like this. I called Shannon Shrine, who runs Augie's Quest on the MDA side, and uh, Jane Gilbert, uh, who runs ALSA National, and Fred Fisher, who's the Golden West uh, CEO, and really encouraged them to try to work together and co-sponsor an event, and, and they have. So kudos to both those organizations who uh, do such a wonderful job of supporting us as patients and uh, trying to drive things forward to a cure as well as all the other things they do for working together to get uh, as many patients here as we possibly can from Southern California, in addition to streaming this thing live. Um, our goal today is uh, not to, unfortunately, we aren't gonna have the time to answer all your questions, although if there are questions, we can get back to you on those at the end. Uh, we'll be happy to follow up. Uh, but we'd like to uh, really focus on four things. Uh, resources and support for the community, supporting advocacy and public policy issues, encourage volunteerism and engagement, and then promoting familial ALS patients and their families' participation in clinical trials. Um, all those are extremely important. Without getting into a long bio on myself, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm number 20 in a group of 21 in my family that's had familial ALS. Fortunately, my aunt, who was number 21, just uh, died two weeks ago. Um, I was diagnosed 18 months ago. Most of my family is from the Midwest. I've lived out here about half my life, uh, 25 or six years. Um, obviously, everybody has a, a good story with ALS and a long story. Um, mine is no different. Um, I've really been encouraged by the people that have sporadic ALS, to be honest, some of the contributions they've made and the dedication uh, to the cause. Um, to name two, Augie Nieto through Augie's Quest and uh, MDA, uh, Dean Rasmussen, who I've gotten to know well, um, who really was the father of a lot of the advocacy efforts for ALSA, our two gentlemen that uh, Dean's father passed away 20 years ago or so with ALS, and of course, many of you are aware of Augie, who has had the disease for seven years. And again, neither of those people are familial. Uh, we familial people are uh, in a, uh, a little bit different game. It's not just us, it's our relatives, uh, it's our parents, it's our brothers and sisters, it's our children. So uh, I'm awed by the amount of work that folks like that have done, and I really want to encourage all the Falls families to participate as much as you possibly can in these four areas we talked about. This is unfortunately our disease uh, and we need to end the darn thing. Uh, and the more we can get involved and work at it, uh, the more opportunity we'll have. So that's really my mission as a patient. I'm committed to do that uh, as long as I possibly can. Our agenda today, uh, again, first off, acknowledging the support of LSA and MDA. We appreciate that. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, I've got a slide about making sure that everyone as a patient is registered with both LSA and MDA. 
we'd like to talk about some clinical trials, some advocacy and public policy issues, uh, the CDC registry, which is vital and important, uh, some social networking and support groups that are available, and then finally, future falls meetings and topics to be discussed. Um, there won't be a lot of uh, scientific discussion in this meeting, considering the fact that we've got some renowned scientists in the next room that'll be coming in here shortly in about uh, an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes. So I think that uh, they'll be much better at handling those types of questions uh, than Steve and I would. Not that those aren't very important, but uh, we're fortunate enough that'll be part of the discussion today following this. Again, patient registration. This is Some of these items are not at the beginning fall specific, but I think important to talk about. If you're not registered as a patient with both ALSA and MDA, please register. Um, most of us, me included, we start maybe, depending on the clinic or hospital we go to, uh, one of the two organizations may support that clinic more than the other. We may get, <coughs> pardon me, engaged with that group but it's important to be engaged with the other group as well. Both provide a variety of uh, information, newsletters, resources. They both have great equipment, loan closets, local support groups, and many other benefits. Um, both of the website addresses, URLs are on this page as well. Take a quick sip of water here. Clinical trials. Um, personalize this a little bit. I've actually begun my second clinical trial here within the last two weeks. I started on the aeromoclonal trial, which is a, a fall specific uh, last June. Was on that for 12, flew down to uh, Atlanta to Emory from Southern California here and participated for 12 months. Could have been on the placebo, could have been on the drug. Went open label and then decided I wanted to continue to further science, so I looked into the DEXPRA trial, which is also taking place, that Biogen trial that many of you are familiar with. And I began that trial uh, about two weeks ago down at UC Irvine. Um, so I then, once I'm done with this one, uh, 12 to 18 months from now, I'm gonna look to do a third. I just think it's important, uh, and everybody to each his own, I think it's, Highly respect someone if they want to stay on the open label component. I thought extremely seriously about doing that, and it's not an easy decision, but did decide to try to participate in as many of these as I could. So I'm on number two, and hopefully on my way to three. Um, there's so few of us patients. If you believe the stats of five to 10% of the population are falls patients, and that there's roughly 30,000 living pals it's 1,500 to 3,000 people in the United States that have familial LS, so uh, I won't get into a long litany about the genes that have been discovered and things like that. They'll spend time on that later in, in the next session. But suffice it to say, they know many of us what causes ALS, so it's vital that we participate in clinical trials. And I think it's also vital that we get our, our relatives, uh, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, children, not until they're older more likely, but get those folks to really participate in these types of things, studies. Um, I got my father to participate in a study at the University of Miami and a long flight for him, but he got involved with that. Um, sister as well. Uh, as many of you know, uh, just again to personalize this a bit, when I was diagnosed 18 months ago, five people in my immediate family that day found out uh, one of them found out they had the gene, my father, who didn't know he had it. Uh, then I had four others that found out they both statistically have a 50% chance of having familial LS, which is my brother, my sister, and my two te teenage uh, children. So it's a uh, really heavy, uh, heavy day when that happens, and I know many of you in the room and the folks on the web have had to deal with those types of things as well. So. Uh, I've highly encouraged my father, who, by the way, is an amazing guy. He's 78 years old. He's got the SOD1 G85R mutation like I do. He's lost three brothers and a sister. Now I've got it, and he has never gotten the disease. He is healthy as a horse. 
So knock on wood, uh, he may or may not get it, but he's a living example of you don't have to sit around and wait to get the disease. If you have, uh, if you're part of a familial LS family, and if you know you have the gene, it's not a death sentence necessarily either. Um, something may, he may get it later, um, but uh, 78 really solid years, so I'm very proud of him. Um, again, I, we're not gonna get into the discussion about the double blind component, about the placebo, we could talk about that infinitum, uh, but the important thing is, if you participate in a trial, uh, you have a chance of getting the drug. If you don't participate in the trial, you have a 100% chance of not receiving the drug. So again, I really uh, would like to emphasize, uh, get involved, uh, here's a little bit of information on the next page. Um, again, there are some falls specific trials. You'll get this information off of either of these sources that I'm listing shortly. Clinicaltrials.gov, which hopefully many of you are familiar with, and if you're not, um, that's the government website that lists all the different clinical trials that you uh, could potentially participate in, as well as the locations uh, of the hospitals and clinics that participate. Uh, also, ALSA and the Northeast uh, uh, ALS Alliance uh, have just done a co-venture beginning within the last month or so where they're staffing an 800 toll-free hotline from 9 to 5 Eastern each uh, weekday, as well as an email address that they have somebody on board that can help you uh, investigate some of these trials, which I think is fantastic. A lot of patients including myself, have been asking for that. The CDC website isn't as easy to navigate as uh, I think a lot of us hope it would be, although I think they're making some improvements. But it's great to have a live person on board that can get back to you with questions. So with that, I'm, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Steve for uh, advocacy and public policy. Thanks, Greg, and uh, thank you to Fred Fisher and the Golden West chapter who uh, has been supporting our efforts. The ALS Association is headquartered in Washington, D.C. now uh, with a large uh, presence here in California and Calabasas, California. And the advocacy department started in 1997 through the generous support of Dean Rasmussen and his family. In 2004, we started to really look at how we can help FALS and their family by providing a support group session at our public policy conference in Washington. And over the last few years, we've continued to do so, and this is hopefully another start of us trying to uh, enhance that effort. We um, have a way for you to sign up for on our website as well as MDA has on their website to become an advocate. I encourage you all to do so. There are many opportunities throughout the year where you really can make a difference on reaching out to your members of Congress and your senators who really right now are sort of top of the whole bunch of folks trying to reach out and say what's an important priority to uh, them. So it really is important to kind of tell your story. Most of you are probably saying, well, you know, I don't really like politics and, you know, why should I get involved? Well, as a person with ALS, 85% of folks who have ALS receive their benefits from the government, whether it's through Medicare, whether it's through the VA. Um, it's very, very important, and we want to make sure that those benefits continue. In looking for hope for the future, um, research uh, really is, has done a tremendous amount of growth through our um, government. St when we started our advocacy program in 1997, there's about $15 million that um, the government was spending on ALS. Now there's over $80 million per year. So while that's still not enough, it uh, continues to go in the right direction. It's going to be challenging these next few years to continue that growth. Uh, in fact, most of us are just hoping that we're able to keep what we have because many members of Congress uh, want to cut a lot of things, and part of that is our uh, hum health and human services program. In uh, looking at some of the other diseases, just to give you a kind of a, some uh, comparison, ALS does fare to be one of the best per patients. Uh, when you compare to the other, and that's really done looking first by NIH, divided by how many people have the disease and how much is being funded. But we know that's not enough, and we want to continue to do more. But we also know that we just don't need more. We need to have it strategically placed. 
and all of our priorities for research through our public policy program really is look through this ALS drug discovery pipeline. Because with a lot of diseases, especially when Congress doubled the NIH budget, Congress was hoping we'd be doubling um, treatments and cures, and that didn't happen. And so many, many disease organizations are looking at how to be more effective in this ALS uh, pipeline. Uh, and the pipeline really starts with basic research, which mostly is done at NIH. And uh, you know, our priorities uh, start with ALS registry, the surveillance aspect of the registry and finding out really how many people have the disease. Um, we work with many ALS organizations, and the numbers vary from about 20,000 to about 40,000. We don't know, and we won't know until we have some more information from the registry. So I'll continue to say this throughout the entire sort of talk today. Please, if you have not done so, um, register and enroll with our registry. Our next program we'll talk about here is a DOD program. It really hits the, the next sort of aspect of um, the pipeline, and that's translational research. That's really the area where you kind of move the compounds to develop therapies for people who have the disease. And that's probably the most risky area. Uh, it's where most of the compounds fail to go to the next step. And um, so, but it's part that our DOD program is really addressing. Looking at our priorities um, this year, we have two. One is for our uh, ALS research program at the Department of Defense, and the second is our ALS National Registry. I'm going to try to go through these slides quickly so we have some chance to answer questions at the end and talk about some exciting new developments. Uh, I think everyone in this room knows that uh, veterans are twice as likely to have ALS. We work um, closely with Secretary Peake back in 2008 to make that service connection. Um, so now no matter whenever you served, um, you will have um, service benefits. And that's not only for patients, but it's also for survivors. So if you know any folks who fought in World War II or some folks who passed away way before 2008, please have them get a hold of us and we'll make sure they enroll to receive their benefits for their survivors. Um, we have um, a program right now that um, our chief scientist, Lucy Bruin, works on with the Department of Defense. And um, you know this research is very exciting because it's really focused for treatments. It's uh, not the beginning part necessarily for basic research. It really is focused on translational research. And our hope is that this actual um, source of new revenue is open for any researcher throughout the country. So no matter if you're affiliated with uh, MDA or ALSA, or if you're just a young scientist starting out, anyone is able to um, uh, solicit these funds. And I think a lot of people get confused when you say, well, this is a research fund for DOD. DOD, the Department of Defense, is funding this research, but clearly any treatment that is found through this program will help out any person with ALS. It really is just a unique source of funding for us to enhance our research at um, NIH, which is about in the middle of 40, 40 or so million dollars. We have um, some more dollars, actually $25.5 million through this program in the last four years. Okay. Um, to give an update this year on what's happening with our DOD program, uh, the House did um, pass another $6.4 million. When we talk about research in the government, it's uh, discussed on an annual basis. So it's every year there's an additional amount that goes to it, and that's why that's so important. Um, the Senate uh, still has not passed their bill. There is $50 million for uh, research for all diseases, and then that will have to go to conference for it to be officially approved. Looking at our next priority, it's the ALS Registry Act. And um, that was passed in 2008 and signed by uh, President Bush. And it really is an exciting opportunity because we hope that this will really unite and unify the entire ALS community. We have some brilliant research out, researchers out there and they haven't over the years always worked together. And the information that's found through this program, one of the uh, stipulations is that you're gonna have to share with others on what they found. Because we really wanna coordinate existing efforts and not duplicate other efforts. I think a lot of times when you're trying to you know, get in this new field, it's hard to find out what's been already done. And that's one of the major aspects of this uh, registry. This will be the largest ALS research program ever created. So it's very exciting that this uh, will continue. 
Um, as I mentioned before, you know, uh, we don't know how many folks have the disease. We uh, think there might be more than the uh, 30,000 that I know the ALS Association has been sharing over the years, but we don't know. We do know some people are living longer, but we really need to have a better understanding of what that actually means. Uh, we have talked about um, really utilizing various resources, um, and some of the things we've put with this registry is to kind of coordinate those efforts. The uh, funding source over the last, uh, since 2006, has totaled to about $20 million. We now fund it at about $6 million a year. That's going to a lot of new exciting opportunities here. Um, and really the registry is kind of divided in two aspects. The first aspect is a national database. So that means coordinating with all the existing databases out there. Um, that's if you're on Medicare, you're part of that database because the CMS has your data. If you're a veteran, you're part of that database already. Um, all these databases have been combined to one entity, and CDC believes that they have captured 85% of all the people that have ALS. That is actually then um, put against the National Death Index to find out how many folks are living today. So if you kind of imagine it, on one side is this registry that's already collecting all the government information. On the other part of this registry, we actually have a web portal. And that's why it's so important for you all to register on this web portal. Because if you are not part of one of these government programs, we need to get more information about you. And this opened um, last October. And we need to, and if, if you are part of the, the government programs, you still need to register. And uh, it'll be indexed by your Social Security on if you're, you know, an existing or not. And uh, it's very important because not only will you give us information about you through the years, but it's an opportunity for us to get information to researchers about clinical trials, about you to participate. Right now, if you're on the uh, registry, these are some of the questions that are asked. And um, we want everyone to fill out each one of these uh, modules because uh, if you are a smoker or not a smoker, we need to know that. And we need to make sure that that data is actually in there. Um, there's another important part to this registry that really talks about the quality of life, and that's what the disease progression is. There's an update twice a year that you'll get cued to go back and tell you the new um, a question is on there, and uh, that will help us to track a number of different things. Here's a description of what I described um, as far as the national databases on how all the, those come together and is also to the right there, the web portal. Now we have a lot of new exciting uh, new opportunities to get information from folks. Some of these new questionnaires are listed above. I'm sure all of you saw last summer the connection uh, between head trauma, the perceived connection between head trauma and ALS. That's one of our uh, new modules, one of our new questions to get information. We also have some more questions about health insurance. We can see the coverage of people with ALS. And a new part we have added for our modules is to really leave it open-ended. I can't tell you how many people I meet and they say, well, I have this unique characteristic. You know, my husband um, worked in an iron smelter all these years, or my wife um, was in the military on this Air Force base. So this open-ended question will be an opportunity for you to put anything in there because it's really, you know, all those clues connected together is how we're going to find out what is the cause and how we can prevent this disease in the future. Some exciting research opportunities we're adding to this registry. One is a biorepository. And it's the first time that we'll be able to have together blood as well as tissue, which is so important for our researchers. I know they're very excited about it. And um, we have now actually on the, on the registry homepage, on the CDC page, it's the first time that we have ALSA and MDA clinics uh, and centers posted together. So if you go on there, no matter where you are in the country, you'll be able to get that information by putting in your zip code. And I know there's been a lot of challenges over the years, but we're really excited because we are working together, and uh, that's one way to show uh, my counterpart, Annie Kennedy, and I at uh, MDA have been really diligent at working with the CDC on this. So that is a new feature. We also have clinical trial information on there. It's, the information is taken from the NIH uh, clinicaltrials.gov, and it kind of has an ALS focus, and we're improving that, as Greg said, to go forward. 
As far as the Hill update, we have about $6 million that was just appropriated in the Senate. The House has not taken up that bill, so hopefully we can maintain our um, $6 million as it goes through conference. And uh, here is the website. And if uh, you do not pick it up uh, on the way out, there's some information about the registry, how to enroll, and some of the information I just described about the modules um, that go forward. But um, both these uh, sort of buttons are on the MDA website and the ALSO website. And uh, I know both uh, organizations will help you if you have challenges on registering. It's also set up so if you don't want to do it all at one time, you can kind of start it, save it, and then go back to it later um, to answer those questions. Because I know as, as people with ALS, you have a lot of things to fill out, and it's very, very time consuming. Um, one other thing we want to mention is that we are getting very involved in social media. We now have on our Facebook page an actual um, way for you to go to the uh, registry page as well as um, allows you to advocate. I know a lot of people who are in Facebook don't want to leave Facebook to um, be able to do some of the other applications and so that's a new kind of uh, find. We started as far as public policy application in uh, May in regards to um, social media. And we found that from May through um, July, we picked up over a thousand new advocates, which is really interesting because, you know, we thought everybody who, you know, wanted to be an advocate for the association knew how to register. But um, there are a lot of different avenues, and we are now, as you can see, become very engaged in social media and uh, will continue to do so. Um, Great. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, I had the opportunity in May to go out to the uh, ALSA Public Policy and Advocacy Day in D.C., spend most of the day in Congress and meeting with different uh, uh, senators and, and uh, House folks. It was an awesome experience. I enjoyed it greatly and uh, got to see six or eight uh, legislators, and uh, they all take it very seriously. Uh, many of you know uh, Jacob Javits, one of their peers at died of ALS a few years ago, so a lot of them, uh, in addition to fellow legislatures that leaders that knew him, know of people that have ALS. So they definitely uh, take it seriously and, uh, and and have a very detailed conversation with you. So if you ever out get a chance to get out there, uh, please do let Steve know, Annie, Annie Kennedy on the MDA side. Uh, they could try to accommodate uh, appointments in addition to seeing people locally in Southern California here or anyone on the web, wherever you're at. Um, <clears throat> social networking is really, uh, as a lot of you are aware, exploding. Um, personally, I've gotten pretty involved in, in social networking on my own. It's also, uh, I still work full time, although I'm not sure how longer, much longer I'll be doing that, but uh, measuring the effectiveness of social media is actually my vocation as well. And I've been involved with that for quite a few years. So I'd encourage anyone on here that isn't uh, monitoring or involved with some of the Facebook sites and some of the websites to get involved. Um, they're all fantastic. And as a patient, you know, we go to see our typically our clinic quarterly, as needed, of course. But we we stop in quarterly. Um, we can attend support groups in person like this. Uh, whatever also has locally in your area MDA, but the rest of the time we need information and the World Wide Web provides that pretty much 24-7. A lot of patients have left a lot of fantastic information on there. It's also a great way to get involved. I know um, one of my fellow uh, pals out east, Rob Tyson, got extremely involved. Uh, and made a difference uh, and is making a difference in the way the registry is structured. Uh, he and some other patients demanded uh, more analytics be done, <clears throat> contacted the government folks directly. They've had an active dialogue and they're actually making a difference. So, um, <coughs> pardon me, you can use this passively for information or you can be as active as you like. And, Anyone that wants to connect with me on Facebook, Greg, G-R-E-G, -E Murfeld, send me a friend uh, request, I'd be happy to hook up with you. Um, and again, if you're looking for social media websites outside of Facebook, both ALSA and ALSA have a nice list of some different links 
of some popular websites uh, that are listed below this sheet. Uh, Steve? Sure, and as Greg said, uh, every year we have an annual public policy conference in Washington. Uh, next year, in 2012, it is May 13th through 15th, and we encourage all of you to uh, come to D.C. and meet with your members of Congress. We also, through our chapters, uh, work to help fundraise to get families to come. So if uh, you are interested and uh, need some help, let us know that, too, and it's been very, very effective. It's a real empowering um, time to see so many people. Over the years, we have about um, anywhere from 800 to 1,000 people from all 50 states that come together and you have people who are just diagnosed and people who um, are, are vented so it's, it's very empowering to see everybody and most importantly it's a chance to you to really put a face on this disease to your members of Congress and staff which is so important in these tight budget times because they're thinking of trying to cut as many programs as possible to uh, to balance their own checkbook this year, uh, I told you about the continuation of our support for Fowles and their family. This year, we're actually dedicating time, uh, not just a breakout session, but a um, half day prior to the conference. And uh, we encourage you all to, to come. And since we are announcing it so far out, we're really asking all of you on what are some of the topics that you think are important for us to discuss. We uh, have an email box there. You can also contact Greg or myself directly. But we're looking for um, you know, issues to discuss. Um, if you know, networking and being able to have a, a more of a support group year-round is something, you know, please write that down. Um, you know, we traditionally have some of the top researchers come throughout the country. And I'm sure if you've been keeping attention, there's really some exciting news that was discovered uh, this summer. And some of those folks will be there. But it's your opportunity for us to address the issues that um, you all would like. In the future years, we actually going to have a full day of this because we understand that uh, many fowls uh, have been asking for much more support than we've been giving. And we'll continue to do that um, through this summit and through Greg's efforts here in California. Good, Steve. I, I think this. Uh, uh, can I get a show of hands? Has anyone in the room been back to the uh, to DC to the conference before? Okay, I see. I see two or three. Um, I attended my first one last year, and uh, we had a falls breakout session. You had to pick, though. You, had, you if you wanted to go hear about Social Security and Medicare, you went to one room. If you wanted to go hear about another very vital topic, you went to another. Falls got an incredible turnout. I mean, there was 120 to 150 people in a room. Um, and that really got me to thinking, and we, you know, again, we've, we've, a bunch of us have talked and think that there's a real opportunity to expand that, not just make it a one-off, but a, an actual session for the familial LS families and patients. So, um, encourage everyone uh, in the room here and also uh, on the web to take advantage of this. So, this is the discussion part. Um, these are just a few topics I threw up on the screen. There's many, many more. I really want to get some show of hands. This is just to kind of stimulate thought. Um, again, we, there could be some other things we could talk about more science and research specific today, but there's a meeting following, so I don't have as many topics on there. But those are definitely germane. But a few would be uh, more information about how clinical trials work. Clinical trial 101, if you really want to understand the phase one, two, and three component, drug pipelines, all those types of things. I've uh, taken some time to try to learn the business side of ALS. Uh, I'm lucky enough to live in Thousand Oaks area, and Amgen is the largest biotech company in the world. And they're headquartered about five miles from where I live, and I've got a lot of friends over there, so I've really spent a lot of time trying to understand the numbers and how big farm and bio looks at a disease like ALS versus investing in cancer or any of a number of other diseases, and uh, it's fascinating. Um, so I think the more we understand kind of how the process works, um, I think we can get an idea of what we can and can't do to affect change and to affect moving these things along. And I know we're all dedicated and very interested, obviously, in moving these things along as quickly as we can. <coughs> 
pardon me, fast-tracking drugs. Again, another thing, there's a uh, ability potentially via the FTA to fast-track a successful drug. We could have discussions about that. Um, more info on the actual falls gene discoveries, which I see an email or an announcement monthly almost the last few months on that. So there's a, uh, you know, at one point I think there was five known uh, genes a year or so ago. It's seven, eight, nine now. So it's, it's growing and, and that's a good thing as far as identifying them. Um, Autodominant recessive genes. Again, there's different types of um, familial LS genes that react differently and we could have more discussions on those. <coughs> Pardon me again. Genetic testing, huge component in counseling. Again, not uh, uh, more on a discussion level. No one individual, I, I believe personally, has the right to tell another individual what they should or shouldn't do from a genetic testing standpoint, but I think we should have an open discussion. And it's good to have it among others that share the same issues that we do. Um, ancestry research is a big component if you're interested in uh, getting involved and understanding more about your family tree and genealogy. Uh, there's opportunities to do that as well. Discussions uh, that we all have to have at some point, like other non-Falls folks do, but our discussions may be a little different, obviously, with children. Um, uh, relatives, probably similar to the others on coworkers and friends, but I think, again, an open discussion in a room with people that share some of the same issues is a positive. Um, financial planning and uh, health insurance issues are, are critical. Um, things as simple as uh, term life insurance versus universal life insurance is a uh, pretty interesting discussion when you're in a familial LS family. Uh, encourage anyone in here to have universal life. Uh, I was very, very lucky I did. Uh, but that's obviously a critical issue as well as the other financial planning components. Um, and then just volunteer opportunities. Again, I'd really like to encourage folks in here to reach out to ALSA, to MDA, to your local clinic, uh, hospital, anyone you come in contact with. They're all looking for volunteers and help. Uh, patients need help, uh, you know, there's walks, there's all types of advocacy opportunities, uh, anything that you're interested in doing, believe me, there's, a, there's an opportunity. These guys keep me, I, I, as I said, I work full time and I feel like I almost have a second full time job doing this that I really love and enjoy. So um, uh, those are a few of the things. Can I, um, can I ask a few folks in the room to make any inquiry or question or something that they'd like to discuss? Get a show of hand. Pardon me? I'd like to add something to this. Okay. Living with ALS. Okay, for the, those on the web, a uh, lady just suggested we add living with ALS. Good suggestion. Good suggestion. We'll take that down. Um, We've got some time here, so any uh, anyone in the room, topics we'd like to discuss, comments? Any questions about previous slides? Sure, ma'am. If you can get over to the mic, Teresa, if you can walk over there, if, if it's able, that would be great. Thanks for doing that. Is it on? Mm -hmm. You have to turn the uh, button on. On top. I don't know if it's live, but we'll find out in a second. There you go. Thank you very much. Yes, Teresa. Hi, my name is, is Teresa, and I'm here on behalf of my soon-to-be 75-year-old father who was diagnosed in February with the ALS. My mother passed away in 1999 of ALS. Her brother, my uncle, passed away of ALS in the early 90s. I don't know exactly what year. My uncle was stationed in the Air Force, my father in Guam when he was in the Army. And so we heard that Guam was very prevalent 
as I can, as you know, everybody I think here knows. Um, it's just funny that, again, we deal, my family of seven deal with my mother as she was going through this. And what I remember with my mother is her falling a lot, her lower body extremities, her knees getting scabs, losing her balance and with that. My father is his upper body. A lot of the tremors, um, the, the spasms, um, upper body chest, his uh, upper arms, hands. My father is, was, well, I'm just, is an artist and a hairstylist. Hands is what he, so it's, it's really hurting him inside that he cannot do what he loves. He still tries, but to the best of his ability, but he says he just, he, he, it's unable to. The hands are getting to the point. So that's what he wanted me to ask because he knows with my mom, it was starting with the lower and within two years, she started going downhill. She didn't get into a wheelchair until two years after. My father was actually had all these symptoms two years ago, but just recently diagnosed in February after all the neurology tests and the, at the VA hospitals and all that, that it was actually the ALS. But two years of dealing with this. So that was his question he wanted me to ask is why it's different with him and when will it start? It's just been stagnant at this point with his upper body, the hands and the arms and here and now the thighs, but he knows how to maneuver where the thighs, you know, would hurt him so much or not. It's not really painful as, as we know with this disease, but still it's very uncomfortable for him when he sleeps and stuff like that. Again, he's going to be 75. He's not into this social networking. He understand. He doesn't even want to go there. And I myself, I hate to say I'm not on Facebook either. But now I'm hearing that's probably what I need to do. But my father will not, he's not interested in updating all this stuff with his, so where I don't know what to do about that part. Um, again, the progression with my dad in contrast to my mom, it's been two years. Can you enlighten on, I, on the different aspects? Yeah. For, first off, your, your clinician at either the VA or uh, what, which uh, clinic is he seeing? He has his primary doctor. He lives in Port Wyneme, Ventura okay. County. Okay. But he, um, the full, he does a lot, a lot of the tests here on the Plumber Street on Sepulveda where I live okay. in the San Fernando Valley. Okay. I live in Ventura County too. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, a lot of these questions are, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a clinician, Steve isn't either. I'm, I'll absolutely make some comments, but you know, get, your, get your medical advice from uh, your clinicians. Just in my own family, uh, you know, I've had, uh, again, my three uncles and aunt uh, all had different levels of progression, both from a timing standpoint and where it started. Um, two in the legs, one in the arm, one bulbal. Um, it, it can go at different paces for everybody. It can start fast and plateau. Uh, it can start slow and speed up. I uh, wish we all knew. I wish we knew. Um, we don't. Again, just in my own family, and I've seen it you know, most of my life. So um, I think I think that uh, the VA is uh, another resource, obviously, to maybe give you information. Um, those would be my comments. I don't, again, I appreciate that. I know it's a, I know you'd like a finite, or your father like a finite answer on the speed and what to expect. My gosh, I wish I had one for myself. And probably everybody in this room wishes they had that as, as well, but darn disease just doesn't allow that. But Steve, you want to yeah. make a comment? Well, well, and while we're not researchers, um, we both have heard from a lot of researchers, and our chief scientist, Lucy Bruin, will be in the next session that you can ask more detailed questions. But what she shared with us, and many researchers share, is that ALS, the term, is going to be really like a term like cancer. There's going to be so many different types of ALS. And what researchers are doing right now are trying to find biomarkers to help diagnosis because we hear this all the time about how tough it is with diagnosis and, Thanks. you know, people spending so much time trying to be diagnosed properly. And we're hopeful with um, many of these clinical trials that um, Greg talked about, there's going to be a therapy out there, which um, if you look at the MS world, where they have now five various therapies. When their first one that was effective was approved, 
they found a number of new diagnoses because neurologists, we feel, were probably more comfortable diagnosing something when there's a treatment. So we think those things will all change. Um, but biomarkers are going to be key. They're going to be key for helping develop new therapies as well as help um, with diagnosis. Um, work closely with the PVA, uh, Paralyzed Veterans Association. If you haven't, we can get you in contact with them. They're very good at going through the bureaucracy of the VA. Like any government entity we have, there's a lot of bureaucracy and red tape. Um, and there are a lot of people who um, are not in social media, so don't feel like you know, you're behind the times. Um, we do encourage you to get more involved with social media. The Golden West chapter has got some great, uh, great case managers that can help you get into that. Um, you know, I, I you know, have parents too, and you know, they like to say they're computer illiterate. Um, but unfortunately, in this world, we have to help our parents to really walk through these steps because this is probably the fastest way of obtaining information and sharing information. So um, please call you know, the Yale Association, Golden West chapter for more help there. And um, you know, we're in this together. We really want to be the support group because we're hearing more and more of these stories. And unless you share with us, you know, we can't be supportive. So please now, give us a How can I get that gene tested now that both parents, what are the odds that I may carry this? Um, again, a, a better question for a clinician or a oh. scientist or researcher, but um, if you have typically uh, at least two uh, certified cases of ALS in your family, then insurance company will typically pay for a gene test. Uh, I had one myself. I was diagnosed, uh, I walked into Cedar sinai a, a year ago in April, uh, did a, uh, a, a series of, of uh, tests and immediately requested a gene test since I knew my entire family had had these issues and, and it happened quickly. So um, if you'd like to stop by and see me later afterwards, I'd be happy to steer you in the right direction on those things. Appreciate it. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a quick comment from the audience, and I think Jenica's got something. A gentleman over here just made the comment when we were talking about the different uh, uh, progressions of ALS. Uh, each ALS patient is a snowflake. We all have different symptoms. It's a definitely a good way of looking at it, right? Uh, Jenica, you had a question from the crowd? Yes, I wanted to share with the group that we are uh, webcasting live and we have uh, 40 different viewers watching at this Great. moment. So a big hello to all the people on the web. If everyone could raise your hand and wave. Great. That's very nice. There's about a 30 second delay, so 30 seconds from now people will probably start saying thank you. Good. Um, <laughs> we have uh, a couple of questions that I wanted to share briefly. We have um, Mary Lowe, excuse me, from the Northern California, who wanted to ask the question about um, these clinical trials that you've been participating in. Do you feel like they've helped you? And then I have a second question that I'll ask in just a second. Sure. Um, gosh, I wish I knew. Um, I don't know. Best, I mean, I, uh, like a lot of patients, I think we, uh, really comb through the different options and try to figure out what the best science is and what the best potential pill would be and the best opportunity. Uh, and we make that call. Um, but I, I'm not sure if it has or hasn't. That's one of the challenges, right, with, uh, with clinical trials as a patient. We haven't had this before in our lives. We can look at others, but they all progress differently. So there's really nothing to measure it against. But Yes, it's made a difference from an emotional standpoint, uh, whether it's a placebo effect or not. I've always been positive. I'm still very bullish. Uh, and I feel like I'm doing something for um, myself, but more importantly for other patients and for my kids. That's why I'm doing it. You got another question? Thank you. There's another uh, pers question from the chat. Her name is Kate. She said, I know there has been a lot of discussion about head injuries and ALS. My husband, who passed away in 2008 from ALS, was both an athlete and suffered a head injury, so I find that part interesting. I wonder what the statistics are for athletes with head injuries. And it's Kate Carr from Hamden, Connecticut. 
Kate, I wish I had some information on that. Uh, Steve, can you, you want to comment? Sure. Um, well, it's an important issue, and in fact, Kate, we are working with the CDC to um, have one of our future questions about um, the impact of head injuries and concussions. We're also working with the CDC for the ability of someone to be able to register the information about a loved one who's no longer here with ALS. Right now, you can only register if you are a person with ALS. Through, uh, again, we're not scientists, but we've seen many uh, hot spots throughout the world, uh, whether it's the soccer players in Italy, or there's a, a number of NFL people throughout the country who have um, been working, who have been diagnosed, and who have passed away from ALS. So um, nothing that we can really share, uh, but there have been a lot of different sort of stories about, um, I wouldn't call it a cluster yet, but clearly a higher incidence of, of folks who are athletes uh, who have ALS. I was given a sign above that we just have a couple of more minutes. I uh, apologize that we got started a little bit late, but as everyone's aware, there's a much larger audience, including I'm hoping everyone here that wants to attend the uh, session that begins at, uh, uh, I guess, what, 5.30 Pacific. So anyone else uh, quickly might have a comment or a question? Yes, ma'am. Lynn Klein, and first I'd like to congratulate both the... Can, can you speak in the mic, ma'am? Oh, sorry. Thank you. MDA and the uh, Golden West chapter for this collaborative effort. It's been a long time coming. Question about the registry. Um, has there been any collaborative effort made toward the online registry patients like me that started the, a similar effort? Sure, um, there has. We have an annual meeting at, in Atlanta at CDC, and in fact, um, they just participated. Um, ben, ben Hayward, who's a good friend, uh, participated. He was there. Um, and their research uh, director, I believe is his title, Paul Wicks, has been involved too. So we really have tried to include every single ALS entity there is out there because the only way this registry is going to work is if we get every single person enrolled. And it started first with MDA uh, and the Yale Association. We've included um, TDI. We've included Les Turner. Um, so if you know of another ALS group organization that's popped up, Worldwide ALS, send them our way because we really, really want to make sure every single person is registered. And to the lady that spoke back there, um, it sounds like um, her, she would fit in the category of the open-ended questions of conjugal ALS. Absolutely. There is a, a group like that where both uh, husband and wife were both diagnosed with ALS. Exactly. And, you know, one of the challenging things about this disease is because people with the disease have not lived very long. So by the time somebody is diagnosed um, or if they're diagnosed and, you know, they're at an end stage where they just barely have enough energy to do the basic needs in life, it's hard to capture that information. And that's why we're so excited about this registry because every single person with ALS will have the opportunity to share their story for us to capture it, for researchers to look at their story and finally connect the dots. And that hasn't happened over the last couple decades and finally that will change. Good, so I think uh, from a time standpoint, uh, we need to end this. Uh, to those of you on the web live, the plan is to start the SE experts meeting at 5.30 Pacific. Uh, if that uh, comes back a few minutes late, Stay tuned, it'll definitely come off. Did you have a comment real quick, Jenica? There was one question, and I know we're- One additional question, one okay. One additional question, and they apologize because they joined the session late. Um, this is Michelle. Michelle, maybe you can tell me where you're living. She says, I'm wondering if there's a connection between MS and ALS. My brother died from ALS, my sister has MS, and she also has seizures. Well, again, we're not um, scientists, but there clearly, I think, are connections between many neurological conditions. Um, you, know, you saw the new information about FTD and dementia, um, and I think that translates. Um, I know that CDC um, has looked at um, ALS and MS together. In fact, about six years ago, there were five um, studies that uh, were all over the country, uh, in the state of Washington, in Herkland, Missouri, 
um, in uh, Kelly's Air Force Base, Massachusetts, that really looked at um, the you know, the connection between the two diseases. So um, we think there might be, we don't know for certain, but um, we're working closely, I know, on the federal level uh, with the MS Society as well as with the Alzheimer's Association and Parkinson's to really kind of see these connections. And we firmly believe that once there is a breakthrough with one of these conditions, it's gonna help out everybody else. Uh, next slide. Okay, so thank you again for uh, attending. Thank you to the folks that are watching live. This is also going to be taped and put on the uh, ALSA Golden West website. There'll be information available to watch this on tape. Uh, if you would like to make some comments, I'm gonna be hanging around down here for a while as well, Steve, you can come down, we'll talk to you as long as we can before the next session starts. In addition, I put web, uh, uh, I should say email information up for myself, Steve, and then Scott Wiebe, who's in charge of patient services, at M <coughs> excuse me, at MDA, nationally in Tucson as well. So please reach out to any or all of us with comments. Uh, this is the first of hopefully a growing number of these. And uh, uh, if you have ideas about how to make these, how to make this thing better, which I'm sure you will, we'd love to hear them. Thanks again. Hi, I just want to make an announcement. There are some refreshments between 4, 4.30 now until about 5.15 if you'd like to go up to, get, once you get out of the doors to the right. There's some refreshments. Please help yourself. And then we're going to gather back here in this room at about 520 to um, start the Ask the Experts. Okay? Thank you.